Hello everybody, welcome back to the second part of chapter 29. So, we have a lot to cover today, so I'm just going to get going. Alright, so last time we left off, we were talking about Picasso, uh, Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque's experimentations with this new style called Cubism, which basically reduces sort of everything to basic sort of geometric shapes, primarily you know, squares, circles, rectangles, those sort of things, hence the name cubism, because it does kind of look like it's made up of a bunch of tiny little cubes. But they're also flattening everything. Uh, they're treating the, um, the picture plane as it actually is, which is a flat space. So they're making every object they create, whether that object is a glass of water, or a table, or a person, to conform to the art, to the, to the, to the, canvas. They're flattening them out. And then they're breaking everything apart. Um, they're taking these shapes, uh, these abstract shape that, shapes that they've derived from a real-life model, like a bowl of fruit or a person or whatever it is, and they've flattened them out, they've abstracted them, and now they're shifting them around. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons why. Um, a big reason is technology. Uh, technology has now sort of revealed that everything that we see is just a very limited amount of the actual um, known universe. And what we see with our eyes is, is a very small fraction of that. And so um, what, what cubism in sort of a way is sort of a response to ideas like Einstein's theory of relativity and this sort of growing knowledge of, the qu of, of quantum mechanics and all these other scientific discoveries and machines like the x-ray machines that literally allow us to see things from the inside out or to see dimensions that, that we didn't see before to reveal sort of a whole universe that is right there before our eyes but we've never been able actually to experience before and in some ways cubism is, is meant to sort of break apart art in that same sort of way so we can actually kind of see the mechanics of how a painting is made. Now does this, is this easy to grasp? No. But they don't, the, the cubists don't care because at this point if you want, the attitude is basically like if you want pictures that look real, well just take a photograph. Um, since art is no longer limited by, by making things look natural or real, it's now time for artists to kind of explore the very nature and mechanics of what makes an image an image. So Picasso and Brock um, create this incredible um, sort of uh, n you know new new form of art called cubism. And and there's two as we talked about the other day. There's two major phases of cubism. There's synthetic, which is the earlier phase, and analytic cubism. Um, but really, <clears throat> you know, for our purposes, you know, just understanding the kind of basics of what cubism is. It's sort of abstracting things, reducing objects to their most simplest sort of shapes, and then um, kind of messing with the concept of space and time and overlapping those two things in really complicated kinds of ways is really what cubism is about but it becomes hugely influential. And other artists uh, start to follow Picasso and Brock's model of abstracting and reducing and then breaking apart uh, uh, th this concept of cubism, and you start to see all sorts of offshoots. Picasso will sort of come back, he'll kind of come, come and go through cubism his, the, through the entirety of the rest of his career, which lasted until the early 1970s. So this guy, I mean, you know, he has almost 80 years of art, he has 80 years of art production. And so it's, it's, his influence over the 20th century is, is, is absolutely massive. Um, and there's not really a decade uh, where he's still not important in the history of art. His, his career is really kind of singular and uh, compared to so many other artists in that he's, he's influential um, the entirety almost of his entire career. 
Um, but he will actually move back and forth. He'll actually go through kind of a semi sort of realist and classical phase for a while. He'll, you know, kind of jump back and forth between really abstract stuff and more cubist based stuff and, and, and jump around throughout his career. Uh, this is from 1921, so this is from kind of well after his early cubist phase. And this is often used as sort of the sort of example of synthetic cubism, which which uses different kinds of shapes and colors and is a, has a lot more variety than analytical cubism. Uh, it is called the Three Musicians. But um, later on, uh, he did a work uh, called um, Guernica, and um, there's a spelling down here, which is uh, very, very late. This is 1937, and this, this work is... Uh, you know, heavily cubist, long after actually really kind of cubism's heyday. But this is a painting that uh, Picasso painted in response to a horrible tragedy. And I'm going to keep this really short. But Spain was in, was Spain was basically under a fascist uh, dictatorship by, uh, under a guy named Francisco Franco. And the legitimate Spanish government was exiled. And in their exile, they hired Picasso to create this painting for basically a world's fair. And he painted it um, to show the horrors of an event uh, of the bombing of a town called Guernica. And actually, there were several other towns. Guernica is a town in Spain under the control of a people called the Basque. And this is spelled B-A-S-Q-U-E, or the Basque people. And the Basque people um, are an ethnic minority in Spain. And they've always had their own territories and their own land. And there's always been a lot of contention between the Basque and the Spanish. And um, this was sort of exacerbated under Franco, who is a fascist and who was believed in ethnic purity, and he wanted to get the Basque people out of Spain. And he figures the best way to do this is to go to his buddy Adolf Hitler, uh, who is now in power in Germany, and the Nazi party are ascending uh, in his home in, in, in Germany itself, and are starting to uh, think about European domination, and things are getting really ugly and scary in Europe at this point. And uh, Hitler decides to... Uh, sends some airplanes, his Luftwaffe, out to Spain, and he bombs these Basque territories. Now, um, this, of course, was a huge tragedy. You know, thousands of people were killed, and uh, this is what uh, Pablo Picasso chose to depict in this sort of painting commissioned by the legitimate but exiled country of Spain. And we can see he's using cubism here, I think, in a very effective way. He's using these flattened, abstract, broken forms to sort of reflect the broken condition of the state of the world, and more specifically also to show sort of the horrors of people literally broken by this bombing campaign of Franco and Hitler. And the figures almost appear monstrous. We have this horse in the center here who is obviously spooked by these bombs falling from the sky, and he's using the sort of fragmentation of cubism to show this horse literally kind of tearing itself apart as it almost tries to run in you know, many ultimate, many directions you know, at once. Uh, we see these sort of ghost-like disembodied heads. We see this woman over here on the far left who is screaming in terror as she holds the broken sort of cubist body of her child sort of falling apart in her hands. Um, he is using this, this cubism and this abstraction to, in many ways, reflect the horrors of this work. I, I believe this is one of Picasso's masterpieces, and I think this is one of the most effective uses of cubism uh, really in the history of art, if not the most effective uh, image of cubism. Um, this is a painting well worth your time, that, that unfortunately time that we don't have. Uh, but if, if you want to learn more, this is one of the great masterpieces, and it is absolutely horrific. And it's a huge painting. This is a 12-foot painting, so it's painted on sort of that grand academic scale.
So Picasso and Baroque's Cubism, though, starts influencing everybody, uh, and not just 2D artists, but 3D artists, as we can see in the artists Jacques Lipschitz and Alexander Arkhipenko. And it's and Arkhipenko's work, I think, that is, is most fascinating, because here we have the sort of basic um, rules of Cubism. We have things reduced to their basic sort of abstract shapes, um, basic circles, lines. Um, but we also see a, a, a sort of a mixing of two-dimensional and three-dimensional space, and especially here in the head of this woman, which is actually formed by a lack of, of material. It is formed by what we call negative space. So in, in, in actuality, this three-dimensional component to her body, her head, is present by not being present. It is, <laughs> it is, it is in its absence that it exists. And I find that fascinating and, and kind of funny in a way and a little playful. But also I loved this, this whole idea is basically taking sort of the rules of art and taking literally making something out of nothing and making something, you know, like how, how, you know, how Brock and Picasso wanted to emphasize that painting is flat, so they flattened everything out. Well, I, I love the fact that that the uh, Archipenko here is is emphasizing that sculpture is a is about as much as much as much about the negative space and the emptiness between the forms as it is the form itself, right? You can't have something without nothing. You can't occupy space without having empty space in there in the first place. And he's emphasizing the importance of the negative empty space. Pretty cool stuff, right? There was another offshoot, offshoot called Purism. This is a French artist, uh, 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 Fernand Leger. And um, Purism really went after what was called a machine aesthetic. It sort of took the ideas of cubism, of abstracting forms to their simplest shapes and sort of flattening everything out and then breaking up those forms um, into... Um, uh, um, something that almost looked mechanical. This, of course, is the huge influence of the Industrial Revolution on art of the modern uh, period. And we can also see that in, in this work, uh, The City, where Leger, um, you know, has taken these sort of forms taken from factories and factory workers and aspects of modern life and sort of abstracted and fragmented them uh, into... Uh, almost a collage kind of effect. But there's a real sort of mechanical quality uh, to a lot of uh, purism. Um, I want to now talk about a group of artists called the Futurist. Uh, and I'm sorry I don't have that more clearly labeled up here, but here it is, the Futurist. The Futurist were a movement out of Italy, and they borrowed heavily from Cubism, as a lot of people did. And these sort of mechanical... Um, technological almost qualities of cubism. And you can see that in this work uh, by Umberto uh, Boccioni and his um, unique forms of continuity in space, where we have this almost cubist-like sculptural figure, but it's also meant, it almost looks like something mechanical. It almost looks like a robot or an android or something, this, this sort of blending, this melding of machine and man. And for the futurist, this is really important. Um, uh, futurists were, were started by a guy named Marinetti, uh, Filippo Marinetti. And, you know, I want to put you in the mindset of Italy at this time because, you know, Italy uh, was far from the sort of glory days of the uh, Renaissance and the Baroque. And, and Italy, um, um, you know, was, was in many ways trying to find its footing. It had really only started to coalesce as a sort of entire country in the early 20th century as it had been sort of divided um, among several different independent states before then. And there's this real need to sort of find a national identity. There's also this feeling that all of Italy's glory days were in the past. And there's, that, there's this idea that, that we should stop looking at the past and we should start embracing the future. And there, but it's even more than that, because for the futurists who believe that the, 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 
the sort of glory of Italy is is now and relies in the present day, not in the past. Uh, they were always looking sort of forward into the future. Were also glorified war. They believed that. Um, this machine age, which brought this incredible new technology, and we talked about this. Um, well, uh, we'll take a look more at this in, during World War One. But this this incredible new technology to destroy, and they thought by sort of burning the past, literally sort of destroying the the great works of of the of the Renaissance and the Baroque period, they could create something new. Because Italy was known for you know Leonardo, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, and they're like we we want we're sick of hearing about those dudes. But there's also a kind of um, there's a a a, a a growing fascism uh, in um, in Italian art as through, as there is throughout Europe, and the, the, in many ways the the Italians were strict nationalists. They believed in this. Uh, are, are, are the, the Mannerists were sort of strict nationalists. They kind of believed in this concept of, of, of racial and ethnic purity, and they believed that things that were slow and weak and should be destroyed, and that we there should be this new world uh, that is fast and efficient and mechanical and futuristic. And they had this love of all things that were fast. They loved speed. They they painted images of trains and fast cars and uh, for them the future was mechanical and it was um, accomplished its 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 goals through destruction and warfare and these ideas are really starting to become prominent in a lot of places in Europe and will eventually ultimately coalesce in the fascist movements um, in the 1920s and 1930s after after World War one but you can see this love of the mechanical um, and uh, in this image of this armored train painted during at sort of the, the, the first few years of World War I by an artist named G, uh, Gino Severini. And over here we can see Giacomo Bala's um, rather charming um, image of a dog on a leash, the dynamism, dyma, dynamism, say that ten times real fast, of a dog on a leash where once again he's emphasizing this idea of movement and speed even when we have a little dog here and uh, he's using this sort of um, uh, effect where it's almost like um, multiple exposures on a camera to imply to imply speed um, but you can see I think the influence of cubism and it's sort of the weird way it handles both space and time by sort of overlapping and repeating objects over and over to show sort of the passage of, of time. Um, so let's talk about World War I. Let's talk about an art movement called Dada, which begins in Zurich, Switzerland. So Dada. Um, and why Zurich? Um, well, Zurich is, is part of Switzerland, which is neutral. And during World War I, this becomes a safe haven for many people who are escaping the war. And let's talk about the effects of the war. The war was devastating. It was the, at the time, the biggest war in history. It was called World War I. It wasn't called World War I. It was called the War to End All Wars, or the Great War. Everybody thought this was it. This was the last war. And they thought that because the level of destruction that occurred during this war had never been seen before. Because this is the first really modern war. Not only because, it's not only modern because it's on its scale. This is a world war. But it's modern in the ter use of technology. This was the first air war. And imagine that. I mean, airplanes at the beginning of World War I had only been around for, you know, five or six years at this point. And so imagine what it was. I mean, airplanes were still brand new. And, and air, air wars were almost like science fiction. Um, you know, a, a lot of this technology, automobiles, telephones, these kinds of things were, you know, some of them were, you know, only a decade or so old at this point. And, and uh, there was this real feeling that technology now is kind of destructive. And when you look at the numbers of casualties in World War I, 14 million people died in World War I. That's an astronomical number. Something like a third of the male population of Europe died in this war. And I mean, there are artists who, you know, many of the artists we studied 
died in this war, or were affected by people who died in this war. But imagine that, you know, where there's not an aspect of your life that isn't touched by war, and where great, the, some of the great old cities of Europe were now bombed, and um, this is also the first trench warfare, this is the first chemical warfare with the use of mustard gas, this is the first full-on tank warfare. Um, you know, you hear horrific stories about traditional cavalry, uh, you know, horseback divisions fighting against armored tank divisions. This is horrible stuff, and a massive amount of people died. And a lot of Europeans especially feel, this is it. This is the end of civilization. We have destroyed ourselves. There is no coming back from this. If, if we have invented technology uh, that, uh, that allows us to cause this sort of level of harm and destruction, then maybe, maybe they're thinking we should just destroy everything. Maybe there's no coming back for this, from this. And there's very much a feeling of, of cynicism and nihilism, uh, that nothing matters, that it doesn't matter if we build something great or beautiful or good, it's just going to be destroyed eventually anyway. And so there's this group of artists, sort of bohemian, really fringe sort of artists who are congregating in Zurich, kind of trying to get out of the path of the war. And they are intentionally tr sort of railing against everything because they believe that all of these institutions, all of these things that were designed to keep us civilized, the great religions and governments and you know, of the world are fa have failed us. And maybe none of this stuff that they've ever taught us is true. So maybe we should just burn it all down. Maybe we should just, you know, ruin the institutions. Because nothing matters. Everything is ridiculous. Nothing makes sense. So there's this real deep feeling in Dada that the world is absurd. It is ridiculous. It is stupid. And Instead of taking things seriously, we just need to make fun of and mock everything and burn it down. And this includes governments, this includes religion, this includes all the great institutions of the world. And this is a, this is a, uh, the image on your right is a picture of a guy named Hugo Ball, who is a poet and one of the founders of uh, Dada. And the Dadaist often met at this club called the Cabaret Voltaire, named after this, this 19th century French poet um, who sort of emphasized the idea of feeling and emotions over kind of everything else. And their, their approach is to um, just kind of make fun of everything. In fact, they're, even the name that they choose for their group, Dada, means nothing. It is a nonsense word. It just it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so in this, this image, we see uh, Hugo Ball performing this poem called Caruane. And as you can read, it is nonsense. Jolly fanto bambala o fale bambla. Grasiga mefafa abla horum. Igiga goramen. Igo bloiko rusla huju. It's nonsense words. It's sort of a mismatch of Latin and, you know, a bunch of other sort of languages sort of thrown together. He's making fun in many ways of the idea of poetry itself, of art itself. And notice how he's dressed in this weird sort of robotic version of basically a bishop's, uh, you know, a Catholic uh, you know, um, priest's outfit or bishop's outfit um, and mocking the church, mocking the whole institution of poetry, mocking everything. Um, let's burn it down. I, I remember reading years ago about this, this sort of big Dada event that was held at the Cabaret Voltaire, and it ended up with a riot and people punching each other, and somebody tried to set the club on fire, and it was just chaos, and the critics said, all in all, a perfect Dada evening, <laughs> right? So it's, it's anarchy, guys. It is... But also with this sort of anarchy and this idea that nothing makes sense, there comes a kind of a freedom. And one of the major concepts that will emerge out of Dada is the idea of chance. The idea that, that we don't have as much control over things as we actually think we do. So we should sort of give in to this concept of randomness and chance. And artists start to sort of mess around with this. This is a work by Jean Hans Arp, um, who uh, 
started working with collages, and this is very much based on um, his exposure to synthetic cubism and their use of collage and cut pieces of paper and things like that. And there's several things going on here. First of all, by using just random cheap pieces of paper, he's sort of taking away the grandeur out of art, right? He's saying that um, Art can be made with the most common stuff. It can be made literally with trash. It can be made with torn pieces of paper. Because art isn't so much about what you use, it's how you use it, right? And this, in many ways, opens up art to anybody. You don't have to go and buy a bunch of expensive materials, Arp is saying. Grab some pieces of paper and make some damn art, is kind of what he's showing us here. And then he's taking these pieces, cutting them up, or tearing them up, I should say, at random almost. At, well, that's exactly what he's doing. And then he's sort of just throwing them down on the paper and then letting them, gl then gluing them where they fell. Um, he is using complete chance to make this design or a pattern. Um, other artists uh, in Dada pushed this idea that art could be made from anything even further. This is um, an artist named Marcel Duchamp, and he is one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And he's a French artist. He was um, a man of many talents. He was a chess master. In fact, he actually ends up quitting chess for a while, or quitting art for, for a good part of his career and devotes it to becoming a chess master. And I always like to think about this when I look at Duchamp's art, because in many ways, He's trying to put the art world, and really maybe the society in general, in, in a state of check. He's trying to get the better of us. He's always trying to be, you know, ten moves ahead of the rest of the world. And Duchamp comes out of the, this European Dada scene. Uh, and he moves eventually, though, from Paris, because Dada ends up sort of setting up, you know, there's a Berlin Dadaist, there's... There's Dadaist in Paris, there's Dadaist, and then there, there, there's uh, Dadaist then in New York. And he moves to New York at a time during World War I where the United States was still not yet involved and were, had remained neutral. We only got in, the United States only got involved in the last year of the war because once we started to really feel that Germany could become a threat and there was this real fear that Germany was going to invade our shores. So that's when we kind of jumped in, but for the first three or four years or whatever, uh, we kind of sat it out. But Duchamp goes to New York and he becomes a member of this group called the Society of Independent Artists who have an art show. This big sort of, sort of public art show. And Duchamp, um, with this work that you see here called Fountain, and yes, it's a urinal, um, he introduces the concept, I'm going to move my little window up here. Hey, I'm up here now. Um, he comes up with this concept called the ready-made because he uses materials that are, you guessed it, already made. And in this case, he uses a urinal. And so the rules for the art show is that it's an open show, meaning that anybody can enter. So he's like, anybody can enter? Sure. Any work of art they want? Sure. All right, I'll be right back, he says. <laughs> and he goes and he gets a catalog um, for the J.L. Mott Ironworks Supply Company. He opens up the catalog at random. Oh, good old Dada randomness. Closes his eyes, takes his finger, it lands on a on a on a item in the catalog and it's a urinal and he orders it 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 arrives in the mail he takes this object unpacks it flips it upside down because why not signs it with a fake name because why not and he submits it and the board of the of this art society say you can't do this this is a urinal this is 1917 this ain't gonna fly man and he's like nope nope look fine print it says will accept any work of art, and they have to accept it. Now, what Duchamp here does is something remarkable. Because he basically, with this work, is, well, he's doing kind of two things. On one level, he is basically being the biggest troll of all time. He's, he's convinced a bunch of snooty sort of New York art people to accept a urinal and put it in, an, in, a, in a show, in an art show. It's pretty funny, right? He is pranking. He is trolling. He is, um, you know, being absurd here. And this is part of what Dada is, right? To sort of make fun of the 
you know, all the sort of great institutions of society, and that certainly includes the art world. But also, with this work, he is changing a basic concept about art, and that is the role of the artist. Because here's what happens. So he puts this work, Fountain, in this art show. And at first, they actually even keep it behind a curtain because it's so sort of scandalous. And, uh, you know, at first people are revolted by, the, by this. Uh, and then they start looking more closely. And some people start reconsidering it. And they start reconsidering it because they're thinking, well, this is in a gallery, a very, you know, uh, but from a respectable, you know, put on by a very respectable art society. And it's also, you know, an, uh, an art object sitting on a pedestal, like all art objects are. It's listed in a catalog of the gallery show, like all of the other works of art. And it's signed. Um, it, has a, it has an artist's name on it. So maybe it is art. If it's in a place where art is and displayed in a way that art is normally displayed, maybe we should consider it art. So Duchamp through a little bit of trickery, has gotten a bunch of people to agree that a, a, a urinal could be called, could be a work of art called Fountain. But here's the really big thing he did. Duchamp didn't make this work. He didn't even sign it with his own name. He simply submitted it to an art show and it became accepted as a work of art. Duchamp is basically showing us something incredibly important here. And, and something that pretty much destroys the myth of the Renaissance artist as this sort of independent, special kind of person. Because in the Renaissance, the idea is that artists have a special talent that they then spend the rest of their lives improving through long, hard practice and study, and they become these great men or women and through their incredible skills and talent. And art, artists contribute greatly to our society. And Duchamp says, that ain't how it work at all, man. What Duchamp is saying is, artists don't actually make art. If artists don't make art, then who makes art? We do, the viewer. Because Duchamp is basically saying, look, it is if you have enough people, or the most influential people, to agree that something is art, even a urinal, then it will become art. And it has nothing to do with, with an artist. We could have put a rock in, in the art show, and if enough people agreed it was art, then you got art. Is he right? I mean, is that all you need? I mean, here we are over a hundred years later in an art history class looking at what is considered to be the most influential works of art in existence, and I've already spent at least five minutes talking about a stupid urinal. I think he's pretty darn right, guys. This is pretty crazy stuff. You don't need artists to have art. You just need an agreement. And then we start thinking about other things in our society that are like that, like, I don't know, laws, like money. We just all agree that money exists and that it's worth something, and then it, it, it is. Holy moly. Maybe these Dadaists are onto something. But Duchamp was a guy who really pushed the boundaries. This is an image of him as, he often used aliases, like R. Mutt, for instance, which might represent the Mutt, the Mutt ironworks that he, the catalog he ordered this from, or might be a play on a popular comic character at the time from a comic called Mutt and Jeff. We don't know. He never really told us. But Duchamp often played characters. For example, uh, over here, he, he is um, shown as this this female persona he created uh, named Rose Salave. Um, but he says, you think you're doing something entirely your own and a year later you look at it and you see actually the roots of where your art comes from without your knowing it at all. So, you know, he's talking about chance here. And he's talking about sometimes you think you're doing things uh, and then that maybe appear random. And then you look back and you realize, oh, this is actually part of something bigger. But maybe through randomness, maybe by closing your eyes and picking a urinal out of a catalog, we're actually tapping into something greater and more important. 
um, we can see this sense of chance in this work uh, called The Bride Stripped Bear by Her Bachelors. Uh, this was is, is a work made up of, of various pieces of metal uh, sandwiched between two pieces of glass. And this is a work that he had sort of created. It's, it's very cubist in many ways. It sort of, um, it also draws heavily from the futurist and its sort of use of almost mechanical kinds of objects here in a very abstract way. But what I find fascinating about this image is the cracks. Because it wasn't until a few years later that he was moving this work and that the glass cracked. And he went, and Duchamp, you know, very famously said, now it's finished. It was this random act for him that finished it, that had nothing to do with him as an artist. Um, so Duchamp is really pushing this, this concept, hey, now I'm in the middle, of, of, of randomness and chance. Also, he's pushing this idea that there can be, that art can make fun of itself, and you can make fun of other works of art. Like in this image here, we see a postcard of the Mona Lisa that he has taken, and he's drawn a mustache and a goatee on her, taken arguably the most famous work of art in the world, and turned it into basically a, a, a prank, almost something like you can imagine a junior high kid doing. <laughs> he's using, you know, this, he's, it's almost like graffiti, isn't it? He's defacing, not the actual Mona Lisa, a rather cheap print, um, of the Mona Lisa. But he's also, you know, in way, in way, other ways being sort of irreverent and making fun of this painting. Because the name of this, this painting is L-H-O-O-Q. If you said this the French way, L-H-O-O-Q, it would sound like the French phrase L-H-O-O-Q, which means she has a hot ass. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, he's, you know, making fun of the Mona Lisa. There's a sense of play here. There's a sense of, of, of being naughty, of getting away with something that you shouldn't, of basically taking sort of aim at the, the sort of big, you know, the, the big boys. Take, take, you know, looking at the Renaissance guys and saying, yeah, you're not all that. You know, it's just a picture. It's just a painting of a woman. What's the big deal? <laughs> um, the work on the right is called Nude Descending a Staircase, and this is a painting that uh, very much draws from the Cubist tradition of sort of showing different moments in time, and we can see almost this sort of time lapse of this nude as she is descends this staircase. So you can see that Duchamp worked in a lot of different styles. He didn't only sort of play with this concept of the ready-made, but he also, uh, you know, drew from Cubism and Futurism and other kinds of, of, of art styles at the time. Dada often sort of remixed um, other kinds of art, and this is especially evident in its use, to, use of collage, or a special kind of collage called photo montage, which is basically just collage using photographs. And you can see the image uh, John Hartfield used here on the left, which was made in the 1930s as a response to the rise of Hitler in Germany, um, you know, using images cut out from newspapers and things like that, or uh, Hannah Hook's image of um, a sort of a satire on, on the German government, uh, what was known as the Weimar Republic at the time, using images cut out from newspapers. Um, and, and this was, you know, this idea of collage was still very brand new at this time, of sort of cutting things up and, and taking images from other sources and remixing them and, and arranging them in a way to create new images. Um, and oftentimes relying on that Dada love of chance and sort of happy accidents uh, in, in the process. Um, During the war also, uh, we start to see Russia start contributing very heavily to modern art. And there was an idea, there was a, uh, one of the major Russian movements at this time was called suprematism. 
which was basically that the supremacy of feeling was more than important than anything else in art. And the, the suprematists especially were really interested in purely abstract or what we call non-objective art. That means the shapes do not relate to objects in the real world. And we saw the artist Vasily Kandinsky mess around with this uh, purely abstract art in um, the, the, uh, the, the Blaureiter, the, the German art, uh, the German expressionist um, art group. Um, but suprematism is, is, is really the first full-on abstract art movement. Uh, and uh, Kazimir Malevich uh, is the main guy behind this. And he was very religious, uh, liked, like um, Vasily Kandinsky was. And he, he believed that we should be viewing art purely as pure color and pure shape and that there was something inherently more spiritual and, and sort of simple about that. Um, that art should not l try to look like something, but art should just be what it is, which is color, line, and shape. And there was something spiritually pure about that. So in 1917, Russia has a revolution, and um, a lot of these modern artists found this very exciting. The, of course, the Russian Revolution was the over saw the overthrow of the Tsar by the Bolsheviks. Um, and, by, and saw the installation uh, of a communist government under Vladimir Lenin. Um, and there is this very feeling at the beginning of the Russian Revolution, this real, first real communist uprising, that there, uh, things are going to get better. Of course, we know historically that they did not, and, and Lenin's form of communism was incredibly brutal and oppressive. Uh, but there's this real feeling among some of these suprematist artists that, oh, things are going to get better. But they learned very quickly that they weren't because um, the communist government actually rejected abstract art and modern art, and they wanted art to look, well, realistic. They were very sort of old-fashioned because communist art, in many ways, was the art of propaganda, and it's hard to convince people... <laughs> to love your ruler if you're just using a bunch of squares and lines and <laughs> abstract shapes. Um, so there is a, a real sort of movement, uh, there's a real movement within communism and within this, uh, the, the new uh, sort of communist government of Russia against modern art. And we're going to see these sort of totalitarian oppressive regimes reject modern art. Um, another, another movement at the time in, in uh, Russia was called constructivism, um, the idea that space and time are the only forms on which life is built, and art, and hence art must be. In other words, um, a lot of constructivist art uh, implied motion and movement. We're gonna, I'm gonna play this sort of in the background while we look at it. Um, but this is, um, in a moment now, uh, really? So this is the work of an artist named, or an architect named Vladimir Tatlin. This is actually a model. The model on the uh, um, on the right was never actually built, but Tatlin uh, created this building that was supposed to be sort of the head, or you know the the um, uh, uh, the government building in Moscow for the new you know sort of Soviet uh, um, Soviet government. And it was um, called the Monument to the Third International, but it was made up of these basic geometric shapes, a hemisphere, cylinder, pyramid, and cube. But it's this crazy spiral, sort of implying this idea of ascension, this idea of growth, this idea that literally sort of the sky's the limit. And it's made up of all these sort of prefabricated uh, modern metal um, parts. Um, but then it's the, in the buildings themselves that are in just absolutely bonkers because the bottom um, wa uh, was a, 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 a cube and the idea is the, it, it rotated and it rotated once per year and this was where lectures and meetings were going to be held. The pyramid, the second story, is uh, executive offices and it, it 
spins once a month. There was a cylinder, which was sort of information and public speakers and things like that. That rotated once a day. And then at the top, there was a, 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 a hemisphere, a half, a half sphere that projected, that was going to project radio messages and, pro, and using film, project images on the clouds. Oh my God, this is insane, isn't it? But there was this real feeling that the, the, the Soviet Union was going to bring Russia into the future, but just the opposite happened. And, and I think looking at, at this building, you can, um, the, or what happened, and looking at what happened to this building, you can really see that. And that's the fact that this building was never built because the Soviet government was broke. <laughs> and all these big promises that they had were impossible to carry out. But there's this real looking towards the future, right? Um, in Germany, after the war, there is a real, there's, sorry about that, guys, there's a real cynicism, and there's a new sort of uh, form of uh, new art movement that comes around called uh, new objectivity. And new objectivity is, 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 in many ways, a continuation of German expressionism in that it's very cynical, it has a very sort of negative view of humankind in many ways, and there's a lot of images of suffering. But... I would say new objectivity is even more violent. It's even more harsh and brutal uh, in its its sort of depictions, and it is ultimately it's deeply cynical and deeply nihilistic. And there's this feeling that nothing really matters, that that the world is inherently corrupt, and you can see that in the images of George, of George Gross uh, and his images of sort of the ruling classes of 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 Germany that are corrupted by money and power and that they're almost like non-people, right? Um, this image I find rather disturbing. This was, uh, he did this during World War I itself and uh, we have this corpse obviously uh, just decimated by the war and the, the, the uh, um, Doctor here is basically saying, "Oh, it's good." <laughs> he KV, uh, which is a basically a German version of "okay," really, and so he's saying, "Oh, it's okay. He's fit to serve." Because at this point, so many young men had been dead; they were had had died during the war that they were basically letting anybody fight. You know, people with disabilities, people, old people who were too old, people who were too young. Um, you you really start to see that, and and they're you know happily approving these people who are who are not in any condition to fight. But there's this real, um, and, and new objectivity, you know, basically saying, look, you know, the, the, we, let's be honest here. Let's look at the world objectively. The world is corrupt, and it's run by corrupt people, is sort of the idea of this new objectivity, and George Gross especially. Um, but Max Beckman, who's another new objective artist, um, you often see images of the worst kinds of humanity. You see thieves, you see murder, you see prostitution. Uh, this idea that the world, uh, it, because it's corrupt up top, it's sort of corrupt everywhere. And there is this, there is the, the this sort of feeling of the this theme of, of violence. Let's look. Um, sexual assault, corruption is sort of everywhere in, in the new objective art. Um, we look at this work by Otto Dix, and this is a triptych. This is very much based on the sort of giant altarpieces of, um, uh, from the Renaissance and the medieval time period. But instead of an image of, of hope and salvation, we see an image of war. Um, uh, um, and, you know, notice the way all of these artists paint in this rather grotesque way with an emphasis on sort of the violence and the effects. Of, of violence. Leaving the new objectivists, let's take a look at a, a very important movement in the history of modern art, and it's, this is surrealism. Um, surrealism draws a lot from the Dadaist. Um, Dada basically says that the world is absurd, the world is maybe inherently broken, and that uh, we should embrace randomness and absurdity, sort of a way of uh, sort of completing this process of self-destruction. And surrealism says something similar. It says the world is absurd, the world doesn't make sense, the world is maybe not what we think it is, but is this necessarily a bad thing? 
uh, maybe by embracing randomness and absurdity, we can actually sort of uh, have a better understanding of our world. We can open up ourselves to experiences outside of the norm, and maybe there's something positive in this. Surrealism is rooted in um, not only its love of Dada, but also in an interest in the um, psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Um, the, um, Sigmund Freud especially is important for his ideas um, involving uh, psychoanalysis, and he is really the, the father of, of, of a modern way of looking at mental illness and really helped sort of lay the groundwork for the invention of both psychology and psychiatry. Now, Surrealism is formed by this French poet named André Breton, and Breton sort of gathers this group of kind of bohemian artists around him, and they start sort of these experiments, because they believe that Surrealism is something that is um, a way of discovering our subconscious. What is the subconscious, or the unconscious, sometimes it's called? Well, this is a theory that was first espoused by Sigmund Freud. And the idea is that we have two brains. We have our conscious mind, which thinks conscious thoughts, like, I have to study for this test, or I gotta go pick up the kids from school, or boy, this movie's really terrible, or whatever it is you're thinking, you are aware of and you are in control of those thoughts. You have agency over those thoughts. But then there's this concept of the unconscious or the subconscious, which li lies below the conscious mind. And in, in this unconscious mind often lie, lies our fears and our desires and the things that drive who we are. Um, and oftentimes these, the, the things that make up who we are are formed at a very young age. And Freud believes that things like childhood trauma, you know, uh, anything from, you know, an, uh, abuse to not being toilet trained correctly could affect who we are as people. Now, a lot of Freud's basic concepts are, you know, a lot of his ideas have since been sort of dismissed. Um, but this basic, the basic idea that, that we could treat, um, we could treat mental illness in the same way we could treat disease or a broken bone or cancer by, by discovering the root of the problem and then correcting that is in entire is incredibly important to our modern life and the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at who we are as people and our idea of uh, ourselves as individuals and the way we understand how the human brain brain works and freud you know believed that if you could get into people's unconscious or subconscious um, you could you could fix those people the people's mental problems uh, you could take care of their traumas, or you could take care of whatever uh, phobias they have, or whatever it is. Um, but you got to get to the root of the problem. He believed it was stored in the subconscious and the unconscious brain. Now the question is, how do you get there? Because if it's unconscious, you can't access it directly through consciousness. So Freud believed, you know, first of all, sometimes it just pops out. And this is like when we, when we speak especially, this is known as a Freudian slip. So I might accidentally say one word when I mean my mother. I mean another. See? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a Freudian slip. And so somebody could look at that and go, oh, so maybe you had issues with your mom as a kid, whatever. Right? Um, or uh, uh, Freud also believed that sometimes when we turned off the conscious mind and just like doodled or drew, then we could access... Um, the subconscious mind, but he believed it was primarily in dreams because when we in, 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 during with our dream state, our conscious mind is shut down, and the subconscious and the unconscious come out woohoo to play. And he's like, in our dreams, oftentimes things are um, we're actually dealing with uh, the things that are really bothering us or uh, the big mental sort of obstacles in our way. But we often, it's often clouded because dreams can be, well, surreal, right? Surre dreams can be um, uh, difficult to decipher or understand. They can be often impossible. Like, you know, we've all had the dream where you're in one place. Then all of a sudden you're in another place, but you're still also in the place you once were. Like, for example, I often dream, um, like if I'm for teaching, for example, all of a sudden I'm in my childhood home. And Freud would say, well, it's, that's because that, that home, which I lived in for, you know, 
15 years or whatever, uh, formed who I was and sort of the root of my being is there. So of course I dream about that place a lot because that's sort of what I associate with who I am. So even though I might be teaching a class, I'm also still at home. But also sometimes, have you ever had a dream where you're talking to a person and all of a sudden they're another person? But you also know it's still the person you were previously talking to? And oftentimes things blend in in a way that you, you're not really sure what is what. Uh, because our, it's our unconscious mind sort of coming out to play. But Freud believed that if we analyzed our dreams, and we could put sometimes these random sort of almost seemingly meaningless symbols together and understand and get a good sort of clear picture of ourselves. And so for the surrealist, randomness and chance uh, was something that didn't mean that the, nothing matters and everything's gonna, let's just tear everything apart. But for the surrealist, that stuff actually revealed the, the very structures of who we are. So this is a, a painting um, by the artist Giorgio de Chirico, and, and this is in many ways a typically surrealist piece. It, it, it combines um, um, a landscape that at first appears familiar and all of the objects appear familiar. Uh, but once we look more closely, we, we realize that nothing quite adds up. First of all, if you'll notice this wall here and this, um, this building in the background exist in two different dimensions. They have two different uh, vanishing points if we're using good old-fashioned linear perspective here. So the, the, uh, the structure of this world is completely impossible. And then we see objects that appear maybe impossibly large or maybe this building is impossibly small. Um, and what do these objects have to do with each other? Well maybe some good old-fashioned Freudian dream analysis could reveal what, this, what these mean. Um, but the idea is that sometimes in the randomness of surrealism, they're saying, ah, there actually maybe is truth. There was a, um, a, a lot of surrealism is, is sort of what we call um, naturalistic surrealism, um, meaning that it in many ways looks realistic. Um, it, it's painted with sort of the traditional rules of Western art things like chiaroscuro and linear perspective and things like that. It's just what is shown is often considered to be strange, like in the work here by Max Ernst, or I think uh, you guys might be more familiar with the Spanish artist Salvador Dali. And this is Dali's The Persistence of Memory, and this is in many ways the sort of, um, I think the greatest example of what we call naturalist, naturalistic surrealism. Uh, we have this landscape, we have this place that could be desert, it could be water, we don't know. Um, just like in dreams, our, we could be in two different places at once. We could both be on dry land and in the ocean at the same time. But look at the way he's painted this landscape. It, it sort of follows the rules of traditional Italian Renaissance art. I mean, giant melting clocks don't exist, but if they did, they would look just like this. So what is this painting about? I mean, it's called The Persistence of Memory, and in a way it's about how things sort of fade right over time. Time slips away, time melts. Maybe like these ants, we busy our lives away working, or, or sometimes, you know, maybe we sleep our lives away. But notice everything is, is difficult to pin down. Is this a face sleeping, or is this a weird kind of bird? Is this a diving board over water, or is this a plank leading out to dry land? And if this is a big cube made of stone or wood, how is this tree growing from it? And what killed the tree? But there's this idea that uh, in, this, in this painting, in its own very surreal way, this is about that the only thing that really persists, it's in the title, is how we remember things. Although the way we remember those things might sort of de degenerate over, over time. So there's meaning here, but it's just difficult to pin down. Dali was not only the most well-known surrealist, but also in many ways kind of a celebrity. Uh, he cultivated this really bizarre sort of appearance. He had this insane sort of handlebar mustache, sometimes that he would grow out several feet. Uh, he would often wear bizarre clothes and he would, you know, you know, 
walk around with like a tiger on a leash and just these bizarre things. Um, and in many ways, his, he lived his life in this almost dreamlike, surreal sort of state. But surrealism, you know, and the name itself means beyond reality, right? But it was in many ways rooted in the ideas of the subconscious and that we can understand this crazy mixed up world if we sort of just looked deeper into our unconscious mind. Here's some more Dali for you. All right. Uh, another surrealist uh, is the artist Rene Magritte. Who is, whose work is often rather humorous. Um, this is one of his most famous paintings. It's called The Treachery of Images. And it is, uh, of course, a picture of a pipe. And underneath the pipe it says, this is not a pipe in French. Um, because it is not a pipe, is it? It's a picture of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. Uh, it is, it is uh, um, in many ways, meant to be a humorous image and sort of be a bit of a gotcha. Uh, kind of image, uh, you know, but the, the basic idea of this painting is that images lie. All images lie. All images are, uh, their job is to convince us we are looking at something we are not. We are not looking at a pipe. We are looking at paint arranged on a canvas to make us think we're looking at a pipe. Um, but Magritte often, you know, like Dali, would paint in a fairly realistic way, but paint impossible things. Um, Merritt Oppenheim is, an, uh, is a, a surrealist artist who, who often used real-world objects, uh, very much in the tradition and the spirit of the Dada's ready-mades. But she would take these objects and she would do strange things to them. And by taking something normal and everyday, but adding an element that was surprising and even absurd or ridiculous, all of a sudden we, uh, we think about that object in a different way. And it becomes now something strange and off-putting. I mean, something as simple as a cup and a saucer now covered in fur becomes something almost grotesque. And there's maybe nothing inherently grotesque about a cup and saucer or fur in itself. But you combine the two and all of a sudden we're freaked out by it. it comes, it's gross to us. It's off-putting. And then we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is something seemingly so innocent and uh, innocuous creeps us out so much? And so we, then we start thinking about, you know, maybe what cups could represent and what fur could represent. And um, I will leave this up to your imagination, um, but it's, uh, in, in many ways, surrealism, it's like the sum is worth more than the parts, right? But there's not just naturalistic surrealism, there's what we call biomorphic surrealism. And this is a much more abstract form of surrealism. And it's called biomorphic because oftentimes the forms were, that were used were these biological, organic, almost, um, they almost were germ-like or amoeba-like kinds of forms. And this comes out of a, an, a, an aspect of surrealism I haven't talked about yet, and this is automatism. Uh, and this was something Freud actually practiced. Freud would, would do something called free drawing, where he would just have people doodle. And the idea was that you were accessing your unconscious or subconscious mind as you were doodling. And maybe in those doodles, the, an image would emerge that would sort of reveal something about your inner self. Uh, it's the same way, like, you know, psychologists use the ink blot test. And, you know, if you look at those ink blots and, um, you know, you see you know, a lot of pictures like murder and death, well, that says more about you than the ink blots, right? Um, so that is, that is something that, um, uh, there's this idea that in, in, when we turn off the conscious mind, the truth comes out. And so there, there starts to develop this, this, this style of surrealism called automatism, where the artists sort of rely on chance. Uh, to create works. They're not consciously thinking about where they're placing everything or whatever even it is they're exactly painting or drawing, but instead they feel like they're pulling from their subconscious mind and revealing sort of some sort of inner truth on the canvas. There was a surrealist exercise called Exquisite Corpse which relied on chance. And it started out as a writing exercise, and it comes from the name um, Exquisite Corpse, where somebody would start a sentence, and the first sentence ever written said the Exquisite Corpse. Uh, but somebody would write a sentence, like, I went to the market and, and then 
that you would hand that paper to somebody else, but you would only reveal like the last two words. Um, so somebody would say, and, you know, I saw a giant buffalo or whatever, you know. And so then you keep on adding and adding and adding, passing the piece of paper around. But you could also do this with drawings. You could start with one picture and then draw just part of the picture and then cover it up except for a little bit of lines and then hand that to somebody else and they would draw off of that. And you would get these bizarre, surreal images. Uh, but with the idea that sometimes doing things randomly could reveal hidden truths. So this is Jean Miro, Spanish artist who uh, very much sort of ran with this idea of automatism and the idea that chance could lead to uh, the creation of art. Another artist in this realm is a guy named Paul Clay, um, is, who's a Swiss artist and I'll be honest, absolutely honest, one of my favorites. But Paul Clay is a guy who drew heavily from nature. In fact, he believed that organic forms were um, uh, um, somehow, you know, the, the basis of all things, right? Plant-like forms or animal-type forms. And he would often incorporate uh, these sort of organic forms, animal and plant forms, all sort of together. You'll notice in the background we have this sort of watercolor here. And notice how it's sort of bleeding. He just kind of applied it almost randomly, right? Um, to create this rather beautiful effect of these colors merging into each other. But this was not something that he overthought. But uh, Paul Clay also drew heavily from, he looked at the art of people with, um, you know, mental problems. He also looked at the art of, of people who had learning disabilities, and um, he was interested in what we call outsider art, art made by people sort of outside of the mainstreams of society and certainly the mainstreams of the art world. But he believed in the art of children and the art of those who were maybe insane could reveal truths or ways of looking at the world that your normal everyday person could not necessarily reveal through their art. And so he started to incorporate um, the, uh, the art of you know, people with mental problems or learning disabilities or the art of children into his art. Um, it's very primitive, it's very simplistic, it's very childlike, uh, but that's sort of the point. He believes in a way that there's something more pure about that, that it's not overthought, that it comes from a place inside of you that is more that is more direct and not corrupted by society, but is more pure. Strange stuff, huh? So, we know that, you know, a lot of this art was, was intentionally avant-garde. It was very outside the mainstream. But at the same time, um, there were political ramifications. And there were some, especially within Europe and the growing fascist dictatorships growing in Europe and Italy and especially Hitler's Nazi party in Germany that thought this art was degenerate. And Hitler, who himself was an aspiring artist and painted in this very sort of traditional manner and was rejected uh, from art school, um, really felt that this art often associated with Jewish people, um, that at least he associated with Jewish people, represented a corrupt an immoral mind. So I'm going to have you guys watch a video about this what degenerate art and what the Nazis thought about it. Um, and because they weren't, they were not fans of modern art, even though, as you'll discover, some of them actually in secret collected this stuff. But there's this real feeling, though, among some modern artists. Um, I'm going to move my image. Here I am again. Um, there's this real feeling among some modern artists that if you reject art that <coughs> pardon me <coughs> there's this feeling among some modern artists that if you reject art that is representational and you approach purely you abstract art art that is sort of just pure form and shape and color and line then in a way that will lead to a better world because art it then isn't symbolic of our hates and prejudices and our beliefs but then it can be interpreted sort of any way 
And so art, there's a lot of artists who just start approaching art purely abstractly. And they just want to celebrate the pure forms. And for them, there's something almost utopian about this. We can see that in Bird in Space by Constantine Brancusi, a work of art that sort of, you know, implies the mo movement and motion of a bird, this sort of aerodynamic shape and this sort of rocket sort of movement implied. But it doesn't really look like a bird, right? It's sort of more of an abstract idea of the concept of a bird in a three-dimensional form. Or Constantin Brancusi and this reference to the shape of an egg in this concept of the newborn, which is maybe a little more literal. Um, there was also the English artist Henry Moore, who um, is probably one of the most famous of the abstract uh, sculptors of this period who took uh, mainly the human form, sort of the main subject of, of sculpture in Western art, and once again, like many modern artists, um, used the human form as a jumping off point for an, an experimentation with, with form and shape. Um, but this this work is not meant to be literal. It's 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 the idea that art doesn't have to be representational anymore. Art doesn't have to look like a person, place, or thing. So art can be free to be art. It can be free to be abstract. It doesn't necessarily have to have meaning. It just has to have a kind of a beauty, um, or an appreciation for the form, like in Barbara Hepworth's oval sculpture, which doesn't really represent anything. It's just a beautiful sh shapes and um, and negative spaces, sort of all kind of interacting with each other. Uh, this idea, I think, is most evident in the work of um, a, a, a Dutch movement called the Style or the Stiel, and the artist Piet Mondrian is the founder of this group, who believed that geometric abstraction, intersecting lines, right angle shapes, linear planes, restricted color palette. Um, sh should be the, the palette that artists use. Um, they uh, based a lot of their, um, their art on something called the golden, golden ratio, which is a, a, a rectangle um, that the ancient Greeks actually believed was the sort of ratio of, of rationality and beauty. But this really comes from the concept that, that um, the, the style especially believed that, that if, we, if we really embraced a sort of stripped-down aesthetic, it could actually make the world a better place. And I know this sounds silly, but bear with me. In the style, they believed that, you know, forms that were more artificial and robotic, uh, almost, more machine-made in their appearance, in a way, were better because they rejected the they rejected traditional art and tradition in general. And for them, tradition was maybe a bad thing because if uh, tradition has led us to years of warfare and fighting. And there's this feeling, you know, by the 1920s and 1930s after the First World War and this feeling that, you know, with Hitler's rise in Germany that we're going to have more trouble in the future, that maybe if we gave up our sort of more primitive kind of tendencies and embraced and embrace a world that was more pure and even more machine-like, then maybe we would give up this need for violence and fighting and conquest and suppression and oppression of other people. I know that sounds a little silly, but it's, it, we need to really understand how, how frustrated people were with you know, you know, the sort of old boundaries of the old world, and that maybe if we made things more universal, um, we can make the world a better place. And one way of doing that is through art, by embracing sort of a neutral kind of art that relied on just the most simplest of forms, lines and squares and rectangles and the three primary colors, yellow, blue, and red. Maybe, maybe by living among this, a world that looks like this, we can have a better world. And this is seen in the steel, especially in its terms of, of architecture and design. You can see these same basic elements, these basic geometric you know, squares and rectangles and lines and these basic uh, primary colors 
uh, playing out in the Schroeder House by Garrett Thomas Rietveld, uh, not only on the exterior, but in the interior and in the furniture. And what you're seeing here also is art that embraces its art or design that embraces its artificiality and embraces modern um, techniques of mass production and the use of of tubular steel, the use of plastics, the use of of, of mass-produced metal and, and plate glass, and uh, everything is stripped down to it ba its basic forms. And as silly as maybe the the sort of um, the thinking is here, this style of architecture and art is still very much present with us, present in our modern day, especially in the form of Ikea, <laughs> which basically in a way has this sort of utopian outlook that, you know, good design should be available to everybody and it should be affordable, not just by rich people, but everybody should be able to go out and buy a chair that's cool or a desk that's affordable and at the same time still beautiful. And it did this by embracing these sort of industrial techniques and this modernist kind of design. Another um, group of artists and designers that thought this way uh, was B the Bauhaus, which was started by a guy named Walter Gropius, um, who becomes director of the Weimar School of Arts and Craft. He changes the name to Das Stachlicht Bauhaus, or the State School of Building. But Bauhaus is this this art school that uh, believed that, um, you know, it was, design is design. And there's really no difference between an artist and a craftsperson. Oh, this is something we saw back with the German Expressionist, right? But the idea that whether you're designing a painting or a carpet, you're still using the basic elements and principles of design. You're still using line, shape, and color. And so it basically says all artists and craftspeople are equal. Um, and they taught carpentry, furniture design, weaving, pottery, metal, stained glass, mural painting, sculpture, and architecture. Um, also, they emphasized function as form. So, buildings should not have ornamentation, but they should embrace the materials that they're made with. They should be true to the materials that they're made with. And what is true about the materials? Well, they're all produced in a factory, and they're made by machines. So, buildings should look like they're made in a factory and built by machines. So should furniture and carpet. This also makes furniture and design and buildings more accessible and cheaper if we mass produce stuff and makes this stuff more available to everybody. Notice there's this almost utopian quality here. So there's a synthesis now between art and industries. We're also going to see um, Vasily Kandinsky, the German expressionist who used completely abstract, who created ex completely abstract art pieces and our buddy Paul Clay become big teachers and instructors here at the Bauhaus. There's also a strong uh, feeling, a strong socialist uh, beliefs among many of the Bauhaus uh, faculty. Uh, the belief that um, you know, art uh, and, and the production of art should be democratized, and socialized. And of course, the Nazis did not like this. And uh, the Bauhaus actually had to move several times to sort of uh, kind of escape oversight from um, from the Nazis, and then eventually it settles in, uh, moves from Weimar to Dessau in 1925. But if we look at the original art building here in Dessau, Germany, uh, created by Walter Gropius, the founder of the, the Bauhaus School, you can see that that truth to materials is everywhere. The steel structure, the steel skeleton of the building is quite evident. It's not covered up or, or uh, obscured by ornamentation, but the actual structure of the building itself is sort of celebrated and shown off. Notice the real simple color palette, black, white, and grays, with the occasional pop of a primary color. We can also see that in the furniture. And no, this is not IKEA from this year. This is stuff created almost a hundred years ago by Bauhaus designers. Um, and both men and women. And you can see the, the overabundant use of mass production techniques of tubular steel, for example, um, or mass produced pl plastics or um, uh, whatever it is, glass, 
used to create these rather beautiful, elegant um, design that and, and also could be viewed as works of art. But there's no real difference here between, you know, in many ways, a, a, a sort of a cubist work, <laughs> a painting by Picasso, and this ceiling lamp or this teapot pot. Whoops, I mixed my um, my attribution there. But you 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 get it, right. Um, this is uh, Gunther Strolz, uh, uh, Goblin, Gobelin's, uh, Gobelin, sorry, it's tapestry, French, not German. Um, which utilizes this same sort of abstract patterns and reliance on uh, basic geometric forms and shapes uh, with a, a lack of ornamentation. Um, but there's this idea that you know you need to remove all ornamentation and let the art, let the let the design be the design. Let red be red. Let a square be a square. Don't try to cover it up. Let's celebrate the purity of these forms and colors. Simplicity in complexity, economy in the use of space, materials, time, and money. So make things simple, make them affordable, make them clean, make them beautiful, make them elegant, make them pure. Pure and simple. That's the Bauhaus aesthetic. And it's an aesthetic that will sort of overshadow the entire history of modern art. This idea that there's a certain purity in letting the materials speak for themselves. If you have a skyscraper made out of steel and glass, let it look like steel and glass. And we can see that in the work of Mies van der Rohe, who was one of the f uh, final director of the Bauhaus, who, whose motto regarding architecture was less is more. And you can see that in this model for this, uh, for this skyscraper. And M Mies van der Rohe really is the father of the modern skyscraper. Um, he, uh, this is sometimes referred to as skin and bones architecture, where, you know, used to, if you built a building, you, the framing was hidden and covered up. You know, you put drywall over it or whatever. Um, but for him, you celebrate the structure. We have a steel, steel skeleton. Let's show off that steel, steel skeleton. Um, skin and bones architecture. Uh, but uh, Mies van der Rohe is... Uh, a guy who's going to become incredibly influential, one of the most influential architects of all time with this modernist skyscraper that he is really starting to mess around with. Le Corbusier, charles Edouard Genere, is another artist, um, Swiss architect influenced by the Bauhaus. And in his very famous uh, Via Savoy, Villa Savoy, uh, in France, you can see this play out. This is a building from 1929, but it looks like it could have been built today. Uh, notice the reduction of shapes to their most simplest forms, squares, rectangles, semicircles, um, co simple um, cylindrical columns, um, and black and white. Uh, and when you look at the interior, we still see this modernist aesthetic play out uh, with these sort of mass-produced chairs showing off their sort of tubular steel and um, mass-produced glass components. Um, but there's a real idea in the modern modernist design and the design that really comes out of the Bauhaus and all of the numerous imitators of the Bauhaus and the steel, the style too, um, that in many ways art and design should be invisible, that it should be stripped down to its basic components and the function of the building is what should be important. So when you're walking down a hallway you shouldn't be staring at what's on the walls of the hallway or the ornamentation in the hallway. Um, the hallway is there to get you from one place to another, so the, the function of the hallway should be what's most important, not how it looks, but it also should be designed, or not how it's ornamented, but it also should be designed in a way that is pleasing and beautiful, in a way that is almost invisible and gets out of the way of its function. Weird stuff, right? Cool stuff. All right, so that ends this part of the chapter. I'll, I'll see you guys next time.